How do you take a vision and turn it into reality? You start at the beginning. You build until things come alive. The building turns into becoming. The becoming begins to transform. And now you've reached the moment when you become the movement. Good morning, movement fam. I want you to, uh, you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And while you are going to Matthew chapter 16, I want to tell you about something really exciting. We are at the beginning of what I believe are the most important six months in the history of the movement. And, uh, as you can, uh, and, and as you can see, I mean, lots of really cool things are, are starting to happen. But the next six months are big, big months. We, are, uh, we have in a month, one month from now, uh, from this Sunday, uh, actually, we are, uh, or actually, no, actually, it was one month from last, <laughs> last Sunday. But we are actually about three weeks away from our anniversary which is our sixth anniversary as a whole but it is our first anniversary as the movement so that's coming up in a month we got some really excited things planned you don't want to miss it you're going to want to invite everybody that you can because from, i'm telling you there's some things that we are cooking up and we are just listening to the heart of god big changes that are going to be made visually and in in all kind of different ways that when you walk in from the jump you're going to notice it's going to be completely different. And not only that, but we are going to hit the ground running that Sunday. So you don't want to be on time. You want to be early. Everybody say early. I know that's a dirty word in Hawaii, early. Everybody say early. I know it just doesn't even roll off the tongue when you live on Maui your whole life, right? Early, early, be early. Bring your friends early. Bring your family members early. Bring your enemies early early bring them all early all right bring them all bring them all bring them bring strangers bring them all early all right and you want to be here it's going to be so awesome 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 and then a month later two months from now is going to be uh easter sunday and easter uh is on uh april 12th i believe and then uh a month after that is mother's day and we want to honor all of our mothers we are a uh, we are a people, we are a movement of honor. We honor to whom honor is due, so we want to honor all of our moms. And then a month after that is Father's Day, right? Father's Day is, uh, is after that. We want to honor all of our fathers as well. And, um, and, and so uh, we, want to, uh, we want to really honor that. And then a month after that, uh, six months from now, uh, it is... Uh, Actually, my math is off, right? Five, four, five months? <laughs> In July, uh, we are going to have our annual Deep Cries Out, which is a night of worship, prophetic worship, unified worship for the entire uh, island of Maui. We have churches from all over the island come together, worship teams from all over the island. And this time, for the very first time ever, we are going to be holding it in the Castle Theater of the Mac. Right, which fits about 1,500 people, and we want to pack that thing out. So we are going to start a campaign called Pack the Mac. Everybody say, Pack the Mac. Prophetically shout it out, Pack the Mac. We're going to pack the Mac with people from Maui who just want to worship God. And they don't care what church you come from, what denomination you grew up in. I can't wait. It's going to be absolutely amazing but if you're in Matthew chapter 16 I want you to say all right Matthew chapter 16 starting in verse 13 it says this when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi he asked his disciples who do people say the Son of Man is this is the question for all time who is Jesus that's the question everyone is trying to answer even today C.S. Lewis says that there are only three possible answers you can come to for this question, who is Jesus? Number one, he's a liar. You can't say you're God and not be God. If he's not God, he's a liar because he quite clearly and plainly 
claims to be God. Number two, he's a lunatic. He's crazy. He thinks he's God, but he's just an insane person. And finally, the last answer, if he's not a liar and he's not a lunatic, then the third answer is he must be exactly who he says he is. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Isn't it amazing how how society tends to undershoot who Jesus is? We tend to undershoot God. We'd rather believe that he's a man of God than that he is God. Then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Ding, 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 he's right. I want you to skip down to verse 21. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. And Peter, obviously having heard all the bad stuff and not hearing the very last part where he would be raised from the dead, Peter, the same guy who said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Whoa, bro. We're going to talk about that in a minute. I want you to hide your toes because it's going to get real. And they'll probably get stepped on today. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Whew, get away from me, Satan. And you grew up in church or are a part of church that thinks that if anybody were to say anything that's less than nice to you, it must be from the enemy. Jesus himself called one of his best friends the devil. Why? You are a dangerous, I want you to listen to this. Jesus, God is speaking. You are a dangerous trap for me. You, my disciple, are a dangerous trap for me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. I want you to turn to the person next to you, and I want you to tell them what I believe Jesus is telling Peter right here this morning. I want you to turn to your neighbor, and I want you to say, I can't be who you want me to be. Turn to the other person because some of you were looking at the back of somebody's head. And I want you to tell the person on the other side, I can't be who you want me to be. Father, this morning I pray that we would hear this one big thing. I pray that we would be freed from the expectations of people, the expectations of others, the opinions of others, and that we would be free today to be who you called us to be and nothing else. God, I pray that we would release the obligation we feel to live up to everyone else's standards. And I pray that we would release others from the expectations and standards we put on them. And that we would like iron sharpening iron we would rub up against each other and we would be forces of inspiration to each person around us to not be our version of who we think they should be but to be exactly who God has called them to be because the movement exists to move people from who they are not to who we want them to be not our ideas of who we think they should be but to be who God has called them to be and so we, we commit it, and so we will be. And I pray that this revelation would free us from, forever from the approval of people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. I can't be who you want me to be. Here's Jesus, and he's starting to reveal himself because there's an end game in mind. 
And up until then, he's been a little bit cryptic about it. He's been a little secretive. He's spoken in riddles, and the disciples are following Jesus. But the disciples were all kinds of people from all different aspects of life. You had fishermen. You had zealots. You had former tax collectors. You had all kinds of people, and each and every one of them had an idea of who they thought Jesus was. And so Jesus asked them, who do people say that I am? And I believe just like human beings, just like each and every one of us, I think when they say, well, we've heard Peter, uh, uh, we've heard Jeremiah, we've heard Elijah, we've heard prophets. I think partially some of these disciples were also speaking from themselves. Like how when you go to a friend of yours and you go, hey, I heard from such and such that they were saying this about you. But you ever said it in a way in which you were using that person and what you heard from that person, but you're using it as kind of an intro because you kind of feel a little bit the same way too? And the disciples were like, well, we think, you know, we've heard people say you're a prophet, you've all this thing. Then he says, who do you think that I am? And the reason why I think there's a little bit of their own truth, their own perspective that they were inserting into those opinions is when he says, who do you say that I am, only one out of 12 spoke up. That means 11 others really weren't sure. They kind of thought they had an idea, but they definitely were not confident enough to answer. It's like if you're a school teacher. I don't know if there are any school teachers or former school teachers in the house. But, but you know, as a school teacher, you say, hey, or even as a parent asking my children, hey, so let me ask you a question. And you ask them a question. When only one answers, that usually means that the others aren't really sure, right? And they kind of go, oh, yeah, yeah. Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, yes, you have received, Peter, the greatest, greatest revelation of all time. And from that point on, he begins, to tell, he begins to tell them, hey, this is what's really going to happen. This is the actual end game. It's not what you think it is. All the disciples believe, just like everyone else in, in, in Israel, that a Messiah, a chosen one, an anointed one, was going to come, sent by the Father. And he was going to be a, 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 a deliverer like Moses of his people. But they thought that he was going to deliver them by overthrowing the Roman government and the governments of the world and establishing him as king. And so when the disciples followed Jesus, they believed that Jesus was going to take over the world and rule as its king. But all of a sudden, here comes Jesus, and he goes, hey, let me let you in on the actual plan. Let me, you're in a trusted place now where I can tell you what the end game looks like. And like so many of us, when God begins to unveil to us his actual plan for our lives, you've been asking your whole, whole life, I want to know your plan, God. I know you. I want to know what you have in store for me. I want to know the dreams that you have placed in my heart that I'm supposed to accomplish. So Jesus says, okay, now that you have a revelation of me, I can now show you a revelation of your destiny. Your destiny's revelation is locked up in him, but the revelation of that destiny, the key that unlocks it, is actually locked up in you. Because until you get a revelation of who he is, he can never give you a revelation of who you are. Paul, uh, Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus instantaneously turns around and said, yes, and now I call you Peter, and upon you the, the church will be built. Jesus always knew who Peter was, but what was he waiting for? He was waiting for Peter to get a revelation of him. Some of us are trying to get a revelation of, God, uh, of our destiny. You want to know. You want to achieve it. But you want to circumvent, actually get a revelation of who he is. Because when you get a revelation of who he is, you can't live your life the way you've been living it anymore. When you get a revelation of who he is, all of a sudden, some of the things that you've been doing, that you've been holding on to, some of the things that you like and you love and you don't want to give up, all of a sudden when you get a revelation of who he really is, now you got to give it up. But when you give it up, it's not a sacrifice, it's an investment. Sacrifices are when you give up something and you get nothing back, you just sacrificed it. But an investment is when you sacrifice something knowing that you're going to get a bigger return. And, it's the, and an investment is a momentary loss, but in actuality, it's a long-term gain. And in this country of America, 
where we want everything right now, we don't know how to make investment sacrifices anymore. Because if we don't see an instantaneous return, we think it must not have been God. And we quit. But Jesus says, this is the end game. I'm going to be accused, arrested, suffer, and die. But on the third day, I'll rise again. And Peter rebukes Jesus and says, heaven forbid, that's not it. That's not who you're supposed to be to me. That's not who I signed up to follow. When I, when I signed up for this, you were supposed to overthrow the government and be the king. I was signing up to be a prince. I was signing up to be a part of the royal court. I thought you picked me up from obscurity so that I could be something special. And now you're pulling the rug out from under me. And Jesus, I don't think so. You need to be who I want you to be. And we live in a world now, in Christianity, and I know this because this is what I am, a leader in the body of Christ. We hold our leaders to expectations to be something for us that oftentimes runs contrary to who God has called them to be. So they spend their entire lives trying to please everyone that they're shepherding. And let me tell you, there is no such thing as a group of people who have all the same opinions. Everyone has a different opinion. Everyone comes from a different viewpoint. We have everyone, politically, spiritually, philosophically, everyone in here has a different idea about what a leader in the body of Christ should look like. And pastors are burning out at record uh, rates. Approximately 1,700 pastors every month are leaving ministry. Because they are dying under the weight of unrealistic expectations. Because everyone has a different expectation. And if I please one person, I'm making another person angry. If I please that person, then this person's angry. But if I please that person, then that person's angry. And then all of a sudden, we become wrapped up in trying to please people and trying to be what people want us to be instead of being who God has called us to be, realizing if I was just who God has called me to be, I'll be exactly not what you want me to be, but I'll be exactly who you need me to be. When I was in Bible college, I was young. I spent most of my Bible college years as, as a teenager. And I remember when my Bible college got its youth ministry program, its youth ministry four-year degree. And of course, when you get a new degree, you're going to recruit people. And I had professors recruiting me for youth ministry because I got along really well with teenagers. I hung out with a lot of the teenagers at the church down the street, and they said, man, Chris, you're a natural. I see you as a youth pastor. I know you're in biblical studies. You're in the biblical studies program, but you should go into youth ministry because you're a natural youth pastor. I even had one professor look at me and say, you need to change your ma uh, major to youth ministry because you will never be deep enough for adults. Adults will never listen to you. You're a natural for youth. You'll, you'll get along with them. And, but trust me, Chris, you're not called to youth. Youth will never listen. You're not deep enough for adults. And I almost changed my major. But something kept me from changing my major, just the quiet voice of the Holy Spirit. Stick it out. Stick it through. And what did you believe? Here we are two decades later. And how many of you know I am so glad that I did not listen to those professors and get a youth ministry degree. I even tried the youth pastoring thing. That was the first thing I did out of Bible college was I was a youth pastor. And you know what I learned from being a youth pastor? 
I like teenagers, unless they're my own. I don't know if I can be around them a lot. The first lock-in we ever did at my house, and Stacy remembers this, we did a lock-in. About, by 11 o'clock at night, Stacy and I had gone into our room, our bedroom, to get some time away from these kids. And we were like, what have we done? What have we done? Is there a way we can just send them home before midnight? You mean we have to do this the entire night until tomorrow morning? I was a youth pastor. Our youth ministry was going, growing like crazy, like wildfire. The problem was it wasn't growing with high school kids and middle school kids. Arthur was there. It was growing with young adults. I would meet with the pastor. He'd say, hey, it's great that you're growing, but you're a youth pastor. You're supposed to get teenagers. I said, I'm trying. I'm doing my best. But I throw my net out. You want me to catch mahi-mahi? I keep catching ahi. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. We live in this world in which the people around you, if you're not careful, will always have an opinion of you. And if you're listening to the wrong person, that opinion may not always be God. And if we're going to be a movement in which we give every person that walks in or becomes a part of our community permission and the freedom to be and to pursue who God has called them to be. We have to start with ourselves in this place. And I want to offer to you that the first person I want to start with is me. Because everything flows from the top down. And if I can't be who God has called me to be for you, none of us will ever be able to be who God has called us to be within the movement. So I want to give you five principles. And then I'm going to talk, I'm going to real talk with family today. But I want to give you five principles to help you to find freedom From the pressure you feel to live up to other people's expectations of you. Right from this story. Number one, this is what I learned. People don't get to determine your identity. They only get to help you discover it. Be very careful of people in your life who try to tell you who you're supposed to be. And what you're supposed to be doing right now when they have no authority in your life. Now, I don't want you to think, I don't want you to think that that means you don't have to listen to anybody but God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1, follow me as I follow Christ. We all need earthly examples. God will bring people into your life who are called to help get you there. But they will never try to turn you into them or their version of you. They will always be concerned with finding out who you are and how they can best position you and help you be who God has called you to be. But you have to be careful of manipulators who will try to shape you to their perception of you by capitalizing on your insecurities and fears to feed their own needs for control and validation. There are insecure pastors out there. There are insecure people out there. And they will try to control and manipulate you because that makes them feel better about themselves. By feeling like they have control in your life. And you need to be careful of that. 
And what we doubly need to be careful of, we need to be careful that we're not the manipulators trying to control the people around us. You know what is one of the funniest things in, in nature for me? People who have never been parents commenting on parents' Facebooks or Instagrams trying to tell them how to parent. How many parents are, are, are in this place? Would you agree with me that it doesn't matter how many books you read on parenting? It doesn't matter how much know-how. It doesn't matter how many parents you hung out. It doesn't matter how many kids you've taken care of. Until you become a parent, you know nothing about what it means to be a parent. Am I right? Am I right? You don't know a thing about being a parent. Let me tell you. You may know how to take care of a child. You don't know nothing about being a parent. Until you have had to get up every hour and a half to pat a baby that you try to feed, try to change their diaper, try to shift around their, their bed, and they're still crying at the top of their lungs every hour and a half, and you got no sleep and got to get up and go to work, don't tell me you understand what, why I shouldn't be frustrated. Don't try to lecture me and tell me I need to have a better attitude about my child. You have no idea. Be careful that you're not the know-it-all and manipulator trying to control other people's lives. And when God is telling them to go this way, you have a perception of who you think they should be and what they should be doing right now. But God has not tasked you with getting them there. But you try to manipulate them anyway. Be careful. Number two. The only opinions that matter come from the voices God has placed in your life. Some of us, got we have to stop asking everybody and their mama their opinion and advice on every decision we make. Some of you have important decisions to make. You have never relied on your mom. Your mom has always told you the wrong thing. Her life ain't together. She ain't following Jesus. But for some reason, you think... She's going to be like Balaam's donkey, and this is going to be the one time she's going to give you the right advice. This is real talk right here, by the way. If you have a godly parent that God has placed in your life and they have mentored you in the faith, count yourself very blessed. Not everybody has that. Stop asking your coworker who solves all their problems with a bottle of alcohol a fifth of Crown Royal every weekend, and that's how they cope with their life. Stop asking them their opinion about, who, about what the godly mentor in your life told you to do because you're trying to get them to validate your disobedience. The only people's opinions that matter are the ones that God has placed in your life. Stop going to everybody else. They're just mudding the waters and confusing you. And you're going to try to live up to a person's idea and the majority's idea sometimes instead of God's ideas for you. This is where it's about to get good. I couldn't wait to get to this one. Remember Peter? Peter caught the greatest revelation of all time. He caught lightning in a bottle. There has never been a greater revelation before, then, or since. Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. It is the truth that changes the world. Every person who comes into this revelation obtains salvation. He catches a revelation. A few verses later, he's rebuking Jesus. Number three, just because someone gets a revelation about you doesn't make them an expert on your life. <laughs> See, Peter caught this revelation about Jesus. All of a sudden, he thought that made him an expert on Jesus' life. And so when Jesus starts saying, this is my destiny, this is my calling, Peter says, not, not so fast, my friend. I'm actually the expert on your life now because I, I know who you are. And heaven forbid, that's not what God wants you to do. You're following Jesus. Somebody decides they want to have an opinion about you and go, no, 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 you're doing it wrong. Are you sure you should be listening to that godly mentor in your life? I think they're steering you wrong. Peter's like, I know you think that that, I mean, I want you to think about this for a second. 
He just said, Jesus, you're not just a man. You're the son of God. You are God himself. He rebukes God and tells him he's wrong. You catch a revelation about somebody, you're right about somebody. All of a sudden you think you now have the authority and the expertise to correct them on everything. Just because somebody got a revelation and they gave you a word once doesn't mean that they're an expert on your life. That doesn't mean you should be going to them for advice about everything. And just because you got a revelation about somebody's life one time, or maybe you were in their life for a season, that doesn't make you an expert on their life either. (laughs) And I know we look so holy in church this morning. We're like, I would never. But yes, we do. We do. Christians are notorious for this. We're ruining people's lives by doing this. This is real right here. This is damaging more believers than every demon in hell that has ever existed. The church has done more to damage people than demons ever could. Not because we're evil. Because of our hypocrisy. The enemy's words have no power. That's why he keeps trying to get you to say his things. The enemy has no power or authority except the influence he exerts on us. He had, the enemy had no authority to bring sin into the world. He had to convince Adam and Eve to do it because the authority was in them. The enemy's words are not powerful Our words are powerful. So the enemy's words are not destroying people. Our words are destroying people. This is so real right now. This is so real right now. I know it's easier to blame the devil for everything going on in this world. But if we would just stop having opinions about everybody's life that we have, that God has not given us a responsibility over, if you don't have responsibility over their life, stop having an opinion about every decision they make. They're accountable to God for their lives. You're not. But you're accountable for your words. And you will give an account for every one of them when you stand before God. I don't want to get in trouble. I want my words to heal, not destroy. I want my words to unite and not bring division. And I know, I know that when you stand for Christ, it makes you at enmity with the world and the systems of this world. So I know that that part is true. But for every person that just wants to run after Christ and be who God's called them to be, I want to speak to their destiny. Whether it's in instruction, whether it's in correction, whether it's in direction. That's what I want to be. Number four. Just because someone sounds spiritual doesn't mean that what they're saying is from God. Can I tell you something? Demons are spiritual. They're spirits. They're spiritual. Fortune tellers are spiritual. Tarot card readers, spiritual. New age hippies in Paia, they're spiritual. People will say a lot of spiritual stuff. Doesn't mean it's from God. The first word Peter says in his rebuke is heaven. You think he did that by accident? Heaven forbid. Man, that sounds so spiritual, doesn't it? Sounds so, so spiritual. Sounds like that came straight from the the mouth of God himself. Heaven forbid. That even sounds like, that, that sounds pretty King James right there. Heaven forbid. 
Because you know when it's in the King James, when they quote it in the King James, that is from God. Just because it sounds spiritual doesn't mean it's from God. And just because somebody says, I feel like God told me, doesn't mean that God told them that. And be very careful that you're not using God's name to further your agenda in someone's life. Well, I feel like God said. Well, you better be careful about using God said. Because in the Old Testament, well, also in the New Testament, when people said God said and God didn't say, they had a tendency to drop dead. Remember that holy reverence I was talking about before? We have lost the holy reverence. I can't tell you how many Christians I'm talking to in ordinary life. They don't listen to Jesus for nothing. They don't even talk to him. And they go, man, I feel like God's telling me that this is what I should do. I know good and well that's not what they should be doing. Well, I feel like God's telling God's telling me that I need to go through a season where I, I don't need to be a part of the body of Christ. I just need to go out by myself and have church by myself and do that by myself. And that's what God's telling me to do. I feel like that's what God's telling me to do. No, no, no. What, what the issue is is you have, you have a problem with authority in your life. Just because you say I think God said doesn't mean God said. And be careful that you're not your own standard of what God says in your life. That's dangerous. Because you only know what you know. And you don't know what you don't know. You may think you know what you don't know, but if you knew what you don't know, you'd know it. But you don't know what you don't know. You may have a general idea of what I don't know. I don't know how to fly an airplane. That's true. I know I don't know how to fly an airplane. But if you ask me, what aspects of flying a plane do you not know? What, what, I have the manual right here. Which chapters don't you know? I'd be like, I got no clue. Why? Because if I knew it, I'd know it. But I got no clue. I don't know. You don't know what you don't know. Stop telling the mentors in your life who know what you don't know that they don't know what you don't know. Will you mentor me in the faith So then they tell you something that you don't know, but because you don't know it, you're offended. Because obviously if it was important to you, you'd know it. So you argue with them, you fight with them, and you go, you don't really know me. That was such an aside. I don't know who that was for, but take it. Just because someone sounds spiritual doesn't mean that what they're saying is from God. Here on Maui, we have to be very careful about this because we live in a very spiritual atmosphere where, where there are so many mixtures of religion. You'll meet people who just mix religions. Hey, let me tell you something. God, call, God calls for unity in his people. He never calls for unity with the world. He talks about the unity of the faith. He doesn't talk about unities of all the faiths. And finally, you have no obligation to be what other people want you to be, only who Christ calls you to be. You have no obligation to be anybody's version of you except who God has called you to be. Now, Spouses, don't look at your husband and wife and say, see, I don't have to be who you want me to be. I just got to listen to God. No. You know what God wants you to be? A good husband and a good wife. And you know what a good husband does? He lays, lays down his life for his wife and loves her like Christ loves the church. You know what good wives do? They submit themselves to their husbands. And this is not a one way submission. When a husband lays down his life for his wife, you know what he's doing? The first act of leadership that a husband should always take is to be the first one to lay down his life and submit and never ask his wife to do something that he's not willing to do. But whatever God in his character, his nature, and his word tells you to be, that's the only obligation you have to be. Nothing else. You don't have to be 
but everyone around you wants you to be. God tells you to do something. It sounds crazy. Everyone around you says, why are you doing that? That's crazy. So you second guess yourself and you go, well, maybe I shouldn't do that. No. In this world of social media, where we can see into everybody else's lives and everybody can see into ours, social media at once gives us more access and less transparency than ever before. We have more access to see into people's lives, but people are less transparent and we curate all of our images so that people see what we think they want to see, not who we really are. So I told you that I was gonna give you principles and I was gonna talk about us. Lately, I've been saying something very controversial from the stage. And it has been controversial because I've had many people come to me, message me, ask for meetings with me about this one thing that I've been saying since the year started. Not, not accidentally, intentionally. I've been saying this very statement. I am not a pastor. I am not a pastor. It has, it has created quite the stir. Because if you're the leader of a church in today's modern world, you have to be a pastor. And they say, well, you're my pastor. But if you're not my pastor, and people are actually very offended by this. We've got a few people leave because of this. Because I, I, I've said, if, if I'm going to, if 2020 is the year of the 2020 listen, and you get to find out from the voice of God who you are, I have to be the first one to step out. And I can't tell you to be comfortable with who you are and unapologetic about who you are if I'm not willing to stand on this stage and say and be unapologetic about who I am and who I'm not and not try to be who you want me to be because I can't be who you want me to be and you will never be pastored correctly if you're looking to me to be your pastor you're like Chris that's not biblical. Okay, let's see what the Bible says. Ephesians 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 11 through 13 says this. Now these are the gifts God gave to the church. So he's talking about the government of the church. And it says, now, this is the gift Christ gave to the church. He gave pastors to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Oh wait, is that not what it says? He gave pastors, only pastors. Everyone's a pastor. Wait, that's not what it says? Is that what it says? Wait. Now these are the gifts. Oh, plural. Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. I want you to notice he says all five at one time. So I don't want to hear this thing about, well, the others passed away, but the pastors and the teachers remain. We're going to make the evangelists not somebody who equips saints to do to do evangelism, but the guy who does all the evangelism because I'd rather not to talk to the people at work. Wait, wait, He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue. I want you to hear this. Because there is a teaching in church that at the time of the apostles, the prophets, all that stuff passed away and all we got is pastors left. And teachers but he says I set up this system with these five to equip God's people this is how you know he says it will last until we all come to such a unity in our faith and our knowledge of God's Son that we will all be mature in the Lord measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ are we there yet are we there yet are we in the complete unity and maturity of the body of Christ? Are we there? Are we close to there? Then why do we think that all that stuff passed away then and only pastors exist? Paul takes it a step further in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, all of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. Here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church and he starts to list them I want you to hear this first everybody say first 
This is who God, this is what God appointed in the church. Not man, not people, not me. God. First, pastors. Oh, okay, sorry. First, apostles. Because apostles are sent out to build the body of Christ. If you want to understand apostles, just put next to it if you're taking notes, direction. That's why they're first. You can't go anywhere if you don't know where you're going. Apostles are first. Second are prophets. Wait, second are pastors? Pastors aren't even second? They're not second? They should be at least second. Wait, wait, prophets. Why prophets? Because if apostles give direction, prophets bring correction. Okay, okay, pastors got to be third. Third are pastors. Wait, what? Teachers? Teachers? Why teachers? Because if apostles bring direction and prophets bring correction, teachers bring instruction. Okay, fourth, fourth, fourth. Definitely pastors are fourth. Watch this. Pastors. Wait, he's not even counting anymore. Wait. Then those who do miracles, those who have the gift of healing, and those who help each other. Why? Because blessed are the doers of the word and not just the hearers only. And we have built an entire religion around hearers and not doers. But Paul says the most powerful people in the kingdom are the doers who are submitted to the direction, correction, and instruction of God. Oh my God. Catch this. Okay, okay, pastors are next, pastors are next. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> then those who have the gift of leadership, I want you to catch this. Everybody wants to go to, lead, wants to be a leader. Everybody wants to be mentored as a leader. You notice that the people who are gifted to be in leadership are below the people who are actually doing the work of the kingdom? <laughs> it is better to be someone laying hands on people in the street watching get healed than to be in a position of leadership. Woo! I could do a whole series on this one set of verses right here. Those who speak in unknown languages, tongues, Holy Spirit utterances. Go to the next verse. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Wait, so he ended the list, he didn't mention the pastor. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? I mean, it's kind of a rhetorical question, but I think in today's world, I would be safe to, I think it's safe to say that we think we're all pastors. Do we all have the power to do miracles? I want you to hear the answer to this question. He doesn't say no or maybe or kind of. He says, you can put that up. Oh, wait, he goes on. Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak unknown language? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages, right? This is how he answered it. Of course not. Don't be silly. Well, if that's true, then if you lead a church, why do you always have to be a pastor? If I were to stand up say, here and say, I'm not an apostle, nobody would trip. If I got up here and said, I'm not a prophet, no one would trip. If I got up here and said, no, I'm not an evangelist, no one would trip. If I got up here and said, I'm not a teacher, no one would trip. But if I say, I'm not a pastor, everybody loses their mind and thinks we're a cult. We have built a system that no longer resembles what God set up as his government. And we wonder why the government of the kingdom does not rule this earth. When you take the pastor who's not even listed, and it's not the pastor's not important, I want you to get this. Pastors are shepherds, they care about people. Jesus proved that you can only shepherd about 12 people at a time. So if, if I am called to lead a movement, but I have to be a pastor, 
This movement will be about 12 people big. But that's not what God has called me to be. God has called many pastors. He's brought people. Many of you sitting in here are gifted shepherds and pastors. That's who God has called you to be. And if that's what God has called you to be, that's the only expectation I want for you. But this is what I have become very comfortable with in the last 20 years. I am not gifted as a pastor. I'm, ap I, I'm actually apostolic in nature. I'm a builder. I build the kingdom. I create strategies to build the kingdom. I, I, God has sent me out. I don't belong to Maui. I'm based out of Maui. But this movement is not called to be contained by Maui. It's, it's called to go throughout the world. And some of you in this place right now, eventually, you will be sent out once to go help build. That's why some of you are like, why am I here on Maui, but I don't feel like I'm supposed to live here forever. Probably because God wants to send you out to build the movement. It's his movement, not my movement. If you ask me what my strategy is, what the movement strategy is, it's Acts. That's it. Let the pastors pastor. See, the apostles bring direction. The prophets bring correction. The teachers bring instruction. Evangelists, salvation. Pastors, protection. I'm not going to ask for your permission to be me. Even if you want me to fit the mold of an American pastor, I cannot be who you want me to be. I can only be who God has called me to be. But by doing so, I can help you be who God has called you to be. And just like I'm not going to apologize for it. Because even though I can't be who you want me to be, I can be who you need me to be. And I have a commitment to that. And I will not abandon you or leave that mandate. So also, I want you to break free from the expectations of people so you can embrace who God's called you to be. Some of you have been told by other people around you, you can't be who God has called you to be because it, it's crazy, it sounds crazy, it doesn't make sense to them, they don't want you to leave them, whatever the reason is. But you have to be who God's called you to be. I want you to stand up with me.